once more again, you come into your house, Lord. As once more again, Father, you have blessed us beyond measure. As once more again, Father, you have allowed your people to gather together. Father, we come not because of us, but we come because of you. We come, Father God, because we stand in need of you. We come, Father God, because we are weak and thou art strong. We come, Father God, because you have exactly what we need. We come, Father God, casting all of our cares upon you. We come, Father God, casting all of our sickness upon you. We come, Father God, casting all of our aches and our pains upon you. We come, Father God, to make an exchange for your strength and for your power. Realize, Father, we can do nothing without the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. Father, have your way in this place. Father, breathe on your people right now. Father, we rebuke every spirit that is not of you. We cast it out and we carry it down even right now. And we lose the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you for moving in your house this morning. Verse number 10. And lastly, we were dealing with 
uh, the spirit of tradition and how me, being raised traditionally, interpret and use the word of God from that traditional view. God had to lead me to a point where I can look beyond my tradition. There was nothing wrong with my tradition. I just needed to add to that tradition and keep building on that tradition. Because too many people, they will get their tradition and then they will get stuck in tradition and think that's all that God has in store for them. I want you to understand that God has more in store for you that is beyond our traditional belief. Mm -hmm. The tradition is the foundation that I stand on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as I live every day, I continue to add to that and add to that and add to that. Because oh, wow. my spiritual growth continues every single day. Well, let me say this. Your spiritual growth should continue every single day. Amen. Amen. When will your spiritual growth end? Easy. When you are absent from the body and you are present with the Lord. No matter how grown you may be in the church, you'll never be so grown that you can learn a little bit more. Amen. All right. All right. Quickly, let me deal with these issues here very quickly. First issue that I shared with you a couple of weeks ago was the issue of women preachers. And I always wanted to take a poll and see who believed, who did believe, but I won't go there. <laughs> God is my tradition says God has not called women to preach. The text that they use to justify this particular position is 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 34 35, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through verse number 12. Those are the scriptures they used to justify mm -hmm. and say that God has not called a woman to preach mm -hmm. because this is what the Bible says. Look at, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, verse 12. I want you to see this in your Bible, and I want you to think I'm making it up. Can't get that with me. Y'all there? Mm -hmm. yeah. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 12. King James Version says this Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be silent, but to be in silence. Oh, I got mercy. Now, let me read this in the Amplified. I'm going to go back and talk about that in a second. A woman must quietly receive instructions with all submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet in the congregation. Ooh, oh, Paul must have been upset. Now, look at your Bibles. Look at this again in the King James. Notice, let the woman, is that plural or is that singular? Great, I'm glad you got it. He said let the woman one person, not all women. The wise of here today. Let the women, let the woman learn in silence with all subjects. But I, now look at this. But I, he did not say, but the Lord. Paul says, I. Hallelujah. We're quick to run through this mm -hmm. and say this applies to all women. Paul is writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. Yeah. The book is called Timothy. Mm -hmm. It's not called Ephesus, like the church of Ephesians. He's writing to Timothy. He said, Timothy, I would not allow that woman to teach. He did not say all women. I didn't write 
book. I just live with it and live by it. Look, look, look. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use her authority over a man, but to be in silence. Let me check, look. God has a divine order that shall not and cannot be changed. Man is the head. There's no hip and some books. The husband is the head of the wife, like Christ is the head of the church. That order will never change. I don't care what our society says. That order will never change. Never. The problem is this. Timothy was raised by his mother and his grandmother. And Timothy was used to taking orders from women. And all the men in my nation said, okay. So he had no problem. When this woman would get up in church and get started, he didn't have no problems with her. But it was creating a problem in the church when she was doing what she was doing. All right. Oh, have mercy. All right. And he wrote his spiritual father to say, how do I handle this situation? Yeah. And his spiritual father said, look, first of all, I want to be what I'm going to teach. Tell her to sit herself down. Right. <laughs> yeah. There is some situation where church folk need to sit themselves down. <laughs> Paul was very explicit here. He was not saying that women should not teach. He's saying that woman should not teach. If Paul was opposed to women teaching or women being in ministry, he would have never mentioned them in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6 and 7, and verse 12, Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, and Colossians. 4 and 15. He would have never mentioned that. We need to stop making doctrine out of something the Bible did not say. Amen. When the Bible is silent on an issue, you and I ought to be silent on that issue as well. Amen. Mm. Amen. Look. I believe that Paul was addressing a woman in this church and not all women in the church. Yeah. All right, so don't get that in your mind. Remember, he used the personal program. Not only that, but uh, I, I need you to understand the letter was written to Timothy and it wasn't written to the church, but the church benefited from the letter that he wrote Timothy. All right, remember that. Now, this was a woman. One woman interrupted the worship service so Paul says, let her learn in silence. And if she has a question, let her ask her husband at home who is her head. Amen. Amen. The proper way for a novice to learn is in silence. Not with 15,000 questions. But you got to understand, a student cannot learn if he's always questioning. Contradicting, refuting, arguing, and deferring with the teacher. Sometimes the best way for you to learn is to have a cold mouth. Right. And sometimes you just need to be quiet and hear what's going on. Look, right. let me hit. In my 30 plus years of serving in ministry, there has only been two occasions when I had to address and deal with women who got out of hand in the church. One such occasion happened here in the church. It was in Bible study one Wednesday night, and one woman just got out of hand, wouldn't listen to nobody. No one. And that's something you need to address and deal with with a heavy hand. You and I have to <laughs> You and I have to understand During that day Women were not educated For the most part It was primarily men So when they came out of the teaching Most of the teaching was done by men I'm sorry, I'm 
You have to understand. The second thing that you have to contend with is when they became Christians, they got a newfound freedom. If you go to certain parts of the Middle East, it's still like it was during the biblical age. Mm -hmm. Well, women has no rights, no decisions, no nothing. Mm -hmm. But once they became into Christ, all that opened up to them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them was taking advantage of what was given to them. But fine, I'll put it to you this way. It is believed that the Apostle Paul planted somewhere around 14 different churches. And out of the 14 plus churches that he planted, he only had two churches that had an issue with one woman in the church. Yeah. If there was an issue in the church universal, he would have wrote the same thing to all the churches. Yeah. But he didn't write the same thing to all the churches. Yeah. And now I'm going to leave alone because I'm digging in the hole and y'all just enjoy digging in the hole. <laughs> but understand, he wasn't talking to all women who saw there was one woman in the church. Yeah. So it was a specific situation that was happening in the church. And if something is happening in the church, it needs to be addressed in the church. Yeah. And if it's happening with a specific individual, it needs to be addressed with a specific individual. Yeah. And it needs to apply to the individual and not to every church everywhere. Right. And we are taking it and applying this to all churches yeah. to keep women in line so that, you know, sometimes they become take over. Amen. They got the way man. They'll be all right. The second issue I share with you is that people believe that the gift of the apostle do not exist anymore. Now there are three classes of apostles. There are the apostles of the Lamb. There are the apostles of the New Testament, or what's referred to as the Ascension Apostles. And I believe that they're apostles today. Just as simply easy. The apostles of the Lamb are those that were sent out and selected by Jesus Christ himself. There are only 12 of them. After Judas killed himself in the eyes, they tried to push him in that spot. But that wasn't who Jesus selected. So he could not be referred to as the apostle of the Lamb. Now, most theologians believe that Paul was the one that was selected to take Judas' spot. But he's not listed in as the apostle of the Lamb. But he is listed as one of the apostles that are inside of the New Testament. Because if you look at it, what the earth should have handed out to you today was a list of 25 different people that are classified as apostles in the New Testament. But that number could be a whole lot more. So if it was 25 then, it could be a whole lot more now. Who am I to say what the Lord can and cannot do? Who am I to say, God, you cannot call me any more apostles? No, nobody. Look, I want you to understand that that's not my call. That ain't even my job. That's not even my responsibility. That doesn't even fit in my lane. Mm -hmm. So if he wants to have a hundred more apostles, a thousand more apostles, look, you go ahead. You're in charge. My job is to follow your leadership. Right. Look, 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 look. If God can have 25 during the apostolic age or the apostles' age or time frame, why can't he have 25 now? Amen. 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 I think there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in this area and around everywhere. Oh, so he has more. Thirdly, the office of the prophet. Now I know that in 1 Corinthians 13 and 8, it talks about prophecy shall cease. Yes, it's going to cease. But the question is, when? Mm -hmm. mm. Lord, have mercy. I'm mighty quiet, that's too bad, huh? <laughs> Look, the question is when. I have an answer for that. I got two issues with it, but I have an answer for it. The answer is found in Matthew 24 and 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, and all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. If I look around today, the end has not happened. If the end has not happened, then the work needs to continue. Yes, yes. If the end has not occurred, the work is not over. Yes, Lord. If the end has not happened, the job is not done. Yes. So remember that the office of a prophet, the office of an apostle and a prophet is considered the foundational work of the ministry, which means they go and establish churches wherever. Mm -hmm. Now, if 
the entire world has the gospel already. There's no longer a need for you and I being here. All right? So the end has not happened yet, which means the work is not over. So we have to continue to spread the gospel. And you still need a whole lot more. Well, that raises the question. Why are there a lot of <coughs> prophets and apostles in our area, in our region? Easy. The same reason Jesus said that he couldn't do ministry or marriage. <laughs> a prophet is without honor except in his own hometown. You see, if you're constantly rejecting what God is offering, he'll give it to somebody else. Amen. Amen. And we are constantly rejecting in this area what God wants to offer. And, and since we're rejecting it, God said, fine, I'll give it to somebody else. I'll let somebody else have it. When you get out of this fishbowl and go to other areas, you've got apostles and prophets all over the place. Yes. Let me say this about these offices, and, and I'm going to get you out of here and let you go to the house. Because as Deke said, y'all got some pinto beans rolling, so I need to get you out of here. <laughs> the word apostle means to send out. An apostle is a representative, an ambassador, a person who is sent out into the country to represent another. Three things are true about an apostle. He belongs to the one who sent him out. He is commissioned to be sent out. He possesses all the authority and power of the one who sent him out. Now that is an apostle. I got some good news for you and I. You and I have been sent out to represent the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. You may not like that you're his representative, but you are his representative. Amen. When the world see you, they see what Jesus looks like. Amen. When the world hear you, they hear what Jesus sounds like. Yes. I just pray it's all good. <laughs> the office of a prophet, which is a unique gift, that is designed to edify the body, it is designed to promote spiritual growth, it is designed to encourage people, it is designed to uphold people. It is designed to give you advice and give you guidance. But I want you to know that in this day and in this time that we live, we still need that office to encourage, to uplift, and to give advice on a daily basis. Not just some of us, but every single one of us. The evangelist is no more than a traveling preacher who goes from place to place to place mm -hmm. and does nothing but preach, preach, preach. Right. Billy Graham Sr. was a perfect example of a traveling preacher. Right. And that's all he would do. Right. He wasn't trying to pastor. Mm -hmm. He was not trying to be an apostle. Right. He wasn't trying right. to be a, a, a prophet. He said, I'm an evangelist. Right. And that's all he would do was evangelize. Right. We need to learn how to operate and function in our proper lane. Amen. Because if we can operate and function in our proper lane, it will solve a whole lot of problems on the inside of the church house. Amen. Because we are quick to jump into somebody else's lane. Amen. The office of a pastor. Well, there's a lot I can say about that. The word pastor means to shepherd. The Lord Jesus told Peter to shepherd his sheep. Peter turned around and told the ministers to shepherd the flock of God. Yes. And Paul told the elders in Ephesus that they were to shepherd the church of God, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ that he paid for with his own blood. Yes. You've got to understand, being a shepherd is not an easy job at all. In fact, it's an uphill journey. And if you think it's easy, I'll gladly give you the rain for a couple of weeks. Then come back and tell me about it. Yeah. You see, the pastor knows the sheep. I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Then 
You've got to understand the pastor feeds the sheep. Yeah. He may have to carry them to the right location to get food. And for some, he's got to spoon feed. Y'all will be all right over here. The pastor guides the sheep. The pastor seeks and saves the sheep that gets wrong. The pastor protects the sheep. The pastor restores the sheep. The pastor rewards the sheep. The pastor keeps the sheep separate from the goats. And sometimes there's a work within itself like never ever before. Amen. The office of the teacher is one that is of the highest calling that you can ever have. It's one of the greatest calling ever is to be a teacher. Teaching is ranked secondly only to the spiritual gift of the apostle and of the prophet. Yeah. You've got to understand that the, the gift of teaching bears one of the largest responsibilities given by God. The teacher will be required to give a strict account to God for his faithfulness to using his gift. The spirit of teaching is the gift of understanding and communicating the word of God. Amen. It is a gift of edifying believers and the truth of the word of God. Yeah. No matter where you go, you need to have some teachers to help guide and direct you to where you're going. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We need to learn how to desire the sincere milk of the word. And sometimes it requires a teacher to help us to gain that sincere understanding of the word of God on this morning. Yes, You've got to understand, my brothers and sisters, as I close this morning, I want to share with you what God has been doing for generations that he's been doing for decades. God has been in the business of giving to mankind more than you can ever imagine in your life. I'm glad that I serve a giving God. Yes. A God who gives all the time. Yes. And he don't just give some of the time. He gives all of the time. Yes. You got to understand this morning, my brothers and my sisters, he gave Adam so he would be the father of humanity. Yes. He gave Enoch so he would be a perfect example of a living soul for the Lord. He gave Noah so he would be a living example of one who saves humanity. Yes, yes. He gave Abraham so he would be the father of the faith. Yes. He gave Isaac so he would have a spirit of laughter in his house. Yes, yes, yes. He gave Jacob so he would be the father of a chosen nation. Yes. He gave Judah so he would have praise in his house. Yes, he gave Joshua so that he would have a champion in the midst of his battle. Yes. He gave Aaron so he would have an earthly priesthood. Yes. He gave Moses so he would have a deliverer for his chosen people. Yes. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm glad I served a giving God. Yes. He gave Boaz so he would have Obed. He gave Obad so he would have Jesse. He gave Jesse so he would have David. He gave David so he would have an earthly king after his own heart. He gave Ahaz so he would have an example of a bad king. He gave Hezekiah so he would have an example of a good king. He gave Solomon so he would have wisdom in the earth realm. He gave room so he would have an example of faithfulness in the earth realm. He gave Esther so he would have an example of courage under pressure. He gave Nineveh so he would have an example of repentance in the earth. He gave Job so he would have an example of a suffering servant. He gave the apostle so he would have an eyewitness in the earth. He gave the apostle so he would have a son under the ministry. He gave the 
the apostle so he would stir them to win souls for Christ. Now, he gave the apostle so he would have a law teacher in the earth realm. He gave the apostle so he would have a committed group of soldiers for the Lord. He gave the apostle so he would have dependence upon God. He gave them so they would rely on the Lord for everything. He gave you the prophet so you would have a divine messenger from God. He gave the prophet so you would have a built-in encourager in the body. He gave the prophet so you would have a warning from God. He gave the prophet so you would have an intercessor in the body of Christ. He gave the apostle so that you would have somebody to say the Lord is on his way again. He gave the evangelist so that you would have a traveling preacher in the world. And I'm mighty glad for every traveling preacher. Because they can go where I cannot go. He gave the pastor so you would have a spiritual overseer. He gave the pastor so you would have a spiritual God. He gave the pastor so you would have a spiritual covering. And I'm mighty glad for having a pastor in my life. I'm mighty glad that I got somebody that I can go to. I'm mighty glad that I got somebody who can understand what I'm going through. I'm mighty glad that I got somebody that I know what you're talking about. I'm mighty glad that I got somebody that I can't what you've been through. I'm mighty glad that I got somebody that said, I understand what your struggles is. I'm mighty glad that he gave me the gifts that he gave to me. Because he gave me what he gave me. I can do what I can do. I'm mighty glad that he gave it to me. Aren't you glad that he gave you the gifts that he gave you? Who I have in his body. You don't understand. He's been in the business of giving to you. Let me help you up in here. I'm on in my hand. That one Friday evening, he gave Jesus. I'm my in my hand. That he gave to you and I. I'm my in my hand. That he laid it down in a bar or two. But I'm so glad that he gave him a new life when he raised him out the grave. Do you have anybody who glad that he gave Jesus? Are you glad he gave you a savior? Aren't you glad he gave you a wake up? Aren't you Mature the church. Yeah. 
I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Every day is young. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. Yes. Yes. Because you know what? You didn't have to give me what you did. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can look beyond me. Yes. And gave me all my need. Yes. And a whole lot more. Yes. He gave me so much that every single day mm -hmm. I can't help but to thank him. I can't let one day go by. There are so many days when I don't even feel like getting out of bed. But I can lay there and say thank you. There are days when storms are raging so bad. Even in the midst of all the storms, I can still say, the reason I can say thank you is because of what he gave me. And when I look at me, it brings tears to my eyes. That he thought enough about me to give it to me. Thank you. 